and I put Autumn's invitation into my backpack to hand deliver to her the next day. I had a 12-year-old's idea of injustice and a 12-year-old's idea of how to fight it. And now I'm nervous. And I'm thinking, like, why are you still standing in front of me? Like, who is this man? Like, why should I let you borrow my phone? I knew that I couldn't hide behind the drapes and I couldn't pretend I had laryngitis. So I took a deep breath and together we sang. Tonight's theme is On the Spot. This life is filled with choices and complicated consequences, which is why when you are put on the spot, it can feel like you are going against the grain, swimming upstream, not going with the flow. But when you take the risk to do the right thing, the rewards can be great. My name is Vara Cooper. I'm based in Philadelphia. I'm originally from New York, and I'm a professional storyteller. Do you remember your first time telling a story on stage? Yes, very well. Um, I told a story at a story slam in Asheville, North Carolina, and I was terrified. And the second I got on stage, I my lips started moving and I blacked out. Everybody started clapping is how I knew I was done. <laughs> <laughs> So what motivates you to tell stories? From the very first time I told a story on stage, it was evident that it was about more than just me. I don't like to be the center of attention, but on stage my experiences are. Um, and then it belongs to everybody in the room. And feeling like I can and want to say things that other people might not be able to or want to but that they feel seen by hearing me say it. That's what keeps me doing it. And what are you hoping that the audience takes away after your story tonight? It's difficult for me to think for one moment that I can enter a room and make any two or more people feel the same thing. So that's way too much of a burden for me. So from the stage, my only hope is that somebody feels something. It has been more than 25 years, and people are still talking about my bat mitzvah. <laughs> the chocolate Sharpay centerpieces, my custom dress with the detachable sleeves, and the invitations that exploded with glitter and ribbons when you opened them because we folded and stuffed each one just so. It was a black tie affair at basically East Egg Beach and Yacht Club, and by the time that first tray of mini snot-filled egg rolls was passed around at the cocktail hour, all of that sacred circumstance had already been eclipsed by the unholy pomp of conspicuous consumption, which happened to be my parents' specialty. <laughs> my sister's bat mitzvah had come and gone during my family's recovery from a devastating car wreck, and no amount of blue eye shadow and Aussie sprunch spray was gonna cover how badly we were doing. So it was with four years of face to save that my mother set out to out party and out glitter and overall outdo anybody at any expense. And she was so caught up in writing those four figure checks for decorations and a dance troupe that she didn't realize that I was not on board for the spectacle that she planned to make of me. I overheard her gushing on the phone to a friend one night and I asked her, mom, you're not really gonna have people carry me into this party, are you? <laughs> and mom doing her best, Faye Dunaway doing her best, Joan Crawford, she says to me, you have some nerve. I'm spending a fortune on this and for who, for me? <laughs> and I could sense that invisible wire hanger in her hand. So I didn't bother to say, well, yeah. Instead, I just begged, mom, please. Don't. But then she just planned and spent in secret. At 12, I was the first kid in my middle school to dye my hair green and wear Doc Martens. And in spite of this grungy, punky Brewster thing I had going on, all I wanted to do was fly under the radar until I could go off to NYU and live my boho Greenwich Village life. You see, the summer before that magical mitzvah year, I went to hippie artist dream camp. 
And that's where I learned that I wasn't too sensitive, like my father always accused, or too serious, like my mother would criticize, or too weird, like my sister would mock, but that I was sensitive and serious and a creative individual who had a light side and a dark side, so you know, I was kind of like the force. <laughs> my bunkmates and I dyed our hair with manic panic, and we learned metal smithing and batik dyeing with boys named Uwa, not Josh. <laughs> and Mike, spelled M-Y-Q. <laughs> we learned about Monty Python there and Ani DeFranco, so you know, the stuff that matters. <laughs> and when my mother entrusted me to make a list of my 50 closest friends to invite to her my bat mitzvah. Of course, my camp friends were at the top of that list, but just below them were all the kids that I'd grown up with, many of whom were also studying Torah portions. And even though it was one of the kids from camp who'd bring the cigarettes that we would sneak out of my party to smoke, it was one of the girls from school that I was forbidden to invite. Don't argue with me, my mother threatened. But why, Mom? She's been to so many of these things already that she knows the words to Yismachu better than you do. And it was true. Autumn Hudson sang the most wonderful rendition of Yismachu I'd ever heard, and my mother didn't even know the words. How dare you insult me, my mother said. Mom, she's my friend. And we eat lunch together every single day, and everybody else is invited. She's going to know. Well, tough, because you're still not inviting that Schwarzer to my party. And there it was. I had always wanted to believe that my glamorous, magnanimous mother was beautiful all the way through, but she's revealing these true colors that don't seem to match my own. I didn't realize Jim Crow was coming to my bat mitzvah, Mom, and I thought you were spending a fortune on this for me, so which one is it? And Mom shouted, Frank! And my father waddled in. She wants to invite the Schwarze. My father looked at me disgusted, and he lowered his voice with his chins. My friends won't see that my daughter has Schwarze friends. But he did not use the word Schwarze. No embarrassing stunts that my mother could plan could make me feel more ashamed than having to exclude Autumn. And in case you were wondering, she did trick me into sitting in a makeshift sedan chair so that six of my guy friends could carry me into the party like the Queen of Sheba. In spite of the green hair and the combat boots, I really wasn't a rebellious kid. But that night, I snuck downstairs, and I took one of those joker vomit invitations, and I folded the fakakta ribbons just so, and I put Autumn's invitation into my backpack to hand deliver to her the next day. I was 12. I had a 12-year-old's idea of injustice and a 12-year-old's idea of how to fight it. So at lunch the next day, I approached Autumn and I took her to the phone booth so that I could deliver her the glittery lie and the sallow truth in private. My parents won't let me invite you to my bat mitzvah because you're black, but I really want you to come. And of course she didn't. And of course, our friendship was not the same after that. So by the time I chanted, Baruchu Adonai Hamvorach, to initiate the ceremony at the heart of all of this hoopla, my rite of passage felt so wrong. At 12, I didn't just learn a Torah portion for my bat mitzvah. And I didn't just learn that year that my parents were wrong about me being too sensitive or too serious. I learned that they were wrong about a lot of things. And I learned that sometimes, even when you think you're doing the right thing, it can still feel pretty wrong. My name is Anthony Azana. I am an immigrant from Guatemala. I came to the States when I was 14. I graduated from the Royal Island School of Design with two bachelor degrees, one in architecture and one in fine arts. And I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. And right now I'm currently working at an architecture firm in Cambridge. 
So can you tell me about how you got into live storytelling? So during this summer, I discovered podcasts for the first time. <laughs> so, you know, during, during my long hours at the office, just sitting at my computer, just drafting, I started listening to podcasts and then I heard people just sharing stories about meaningful things that completely changed the way they think. And that got me interested. Like I have a lot of things that happened to me. So by started writing and just giving it a shot and trying it out, I was able to make a pitch, <laughs> yeah. So how did you choose this story to be the one that you wanted to tell tonight? Because I think we have a misconception right now in terms of like how undocumented immigrants are being portrayed in the media. Nobody gets a chance to like understand that a lot of these people, they're not out there just like selling drugs or doing all the stuff, you know, they're like hardworking people who for most of the time, they're even afraid to leave their homes. And a lot of these people come at an older age to the point where they don't have any social connections. Mm -hmm. They just work and go home and they don't party, you know, because they're afraid that if they might catch them driving, they might deport them. They don't get a second chance. I'm waiting for the bus to Boston. I'm heading to my very first architecture job interview fresh out of college. I'm very excited and nervous. And I even get to the station an hour earlier than my departure time, even though I live like 10 minutes from the building. <laughs> I have my favorite shirt on, it's freshly pressed, and I'm going over the things I want to say about my work in my head. And after a while, I'm realizing that it's past my departure time and my bus is still not here. So I begin to look around and I notice a handwritten sign that read, this bus stop has temporarily been relocated. <laughs> so now I begin to panic and I'm rushing to the new location, and as soon as I approach the stop, my bus is leaving. So I'm pounding on the side of the bus, and the people on the bus are just looking at me through the windows, but no one says anything or does anything to make the bus driver stop. So I, I go back inside, and fortunately enough, I was a lot earlier, and I was able to catch the following bus. And as soon as I get to South Station, I quickly request an Uber, and to my surprise, there was very light traffic, and I was able to make it to my interview on time. But all of this rushing got me even more nervous. Now I'm anxious and I'm sweating. And during my interview, I was sweating so much to the point that the interviewer had to offer me a napkin to dry the sweat. <laughs> and I continue sweating, so she offers me another napkin. <laughs> At this point, I'm really embarrassed and I just want the interview to be over. It finally ends. And as I'm going back home, I'm in South Station again. And I'm usually a very outgoing person. I like meeting new people. I like talking to my Uber drivers. But after this long and stressful day, I just want to be alone. But I'm looking around again, and I noticed a man. He was kind of like wandering around the building. And he looked like he had no idea where he was going. And he was kind of trying to talk to people, but everybody kept on turning around as soon as he approaches them. I mean, he was wearing shoes with no shoelaces. He was wearing heavily worn jeans. And he eventually ap approaches me. And with a very heavy Spanish accent, he asked for the time in English. So I tell him the time, but he's still standing in front of me. So I try to tell him the time again, but this time in Spanish. And then in Spanish, he asks if he can also borrow my phone. See, in my head, I'm like, man, I don't know if I should trust somebody without shoelaces. <laughs> But the thing is, though, that I've been, I've been mugged before after lending somebody my phone, and I didn't want this to happen again. But before I, say, before I say a thing, he introduces himself. He says his name is Elliot, and he's from Honduras. He also says that he has just been released from a local detention center, and he's trying to get in contact with his family after two months of being detained. And now I'm nervous. And I'm thinking, like, why are you still standing in front of me? Like, who is this man? Like, why, why should I let you borrow my phone? And then he proceeds to tell me that he's undocumented. And he's telling me how he was treated during his time at the detention center. And all he wants to do is just to go home. This time, I, I lend him my phone. He calls his dad three different times. And his dad doesn't pick up. And he's sad. And then he eventually reaches for his back pocket and takes out a yellow envelope containing a printed receipt for a one-way ticket to Chicago. And with a very confused expression, he's asking me if I know how the tickets worked. 
And see, it's not like an actual ticket, so I have no idea how they work. But I suggest that perhaps the people at the bus counter can help us. So I asked the woman if she can help us print the tickets. She picks it up with hesitation. Then she's looking at the both of us. But then she's looking at Elliot a bit longer than me. And then she asked for our IDs. Now I'm realizing that Elliot doesn't have an ID. And all I can think about is my family, some of my closest friends who have been deported. And they've been treated like, like criminals just for the simple fact they're trying to seek a better life in the United States. And also, all these videos of ICE police invading the buses and taking people into custody who have failed to show their identifications begin to play in my head. And I don't want them to take Elliot away. Eventually, Elliot no notices my hesitation, and he's asking if everything is okay. And then I reach for my pocket, I take out my ID, and I say, yes, everything is going to be okay. So I give the lady my ID. She completely forgets about Elliot, and she proceeds to print out the tickets. As we head towards his designated gate, I notice Elliot having the biggest smile, but I'm still, I'm still anxious because even though I just helped him print out the tickets, I can't guarantee what the next 17 hours are gonna be for him. Then we call, we call his dad five different times, still doesn't pick up. So I asked Elliot if I can take pictures of, of his tickets and I, because I wanted to keep on contacting his dad and making sure to share the itinerary with him. And I also asked him if he's on Facebook and if he will reach out to me once he makes it to Chicago. His bus finally arrives, we say goodbye, and 30 minutes later, he, he dad finally calls and I explain him everything. In the end, I was able to get the job I applied for. <laughs> and Elio makes it to Chicago. But that day, the both of us started new lives. And although our lives may not cross in the future, I can only hope that wherever Elliot is, that he continues to make it home. Thank you. My name is Alyssa Adriani. I grew up in Needham, Massachusetts, and I'm a fourth generation resident of Massachusetts. I work as an interfaith chaplain, and I live in Walpole with my husband and my two-year-old son. So what do you find most satisfying about telling a story on stage? I think there are small moments of connection. It even happens before you get up on stage when you're talking with the other storytellers, perhaps. And then on the stage, without having a personal one-on-one -on -one conversation with the whole audience, I still feel like I'm connecting with people in the audience as you, you see their, you know, their facial expressions and you see maybe their body language and you know that something that you have said, something you've talked about, struck a chord with them mm -hmm. and there's something that resonates for, um, for a stranger. And how has storytelling in particular helped you with the process of pushing yourself beyond your comfort zone? I am kind of an introverted person and my, my natural place, my natural setting is um, more likely at home, uh, perhaps with a book or a friend or a couple of friends, small groups. Uh, so being up on stage in front of quite a few people is definitely out of my comfort zone. But again, I feel like that's where life is truly lived when we push ourselves a little bit further and realize wow, something that I never thought that I could do, I did it. Singing is not my thing. And I'm not really sure why, but I think it might have something to do with the fact that when I was very little, I was a shy child, and I discovered that if I put my fingertips over the outside of my ears and I sang, it sounded terrible. And I didn't want anybody to hear that. So for as long as I can remember, I've done everything I can think of to avoid singing. In elementary school, on the day of a school concert, I would always mysteriously lose my voice. Later on in junior high, I went to Catholic school where we had to be in the school choir. So on days of choir practice, I would put on my choir robe, stand in the back row, and just try to blend in with the drapes and hope that nobody would notice me. Later on in graduate school where I was training to become a chaplain, I had to up my game a little bit, but I realized anytime there was a service, I could close my eyes 
and sort of move my head along, and everybody would think I was just in deep meditative reverie. When I became a hospital chaplain, I was often asked to offer a song at a memorial service or an event, but I would deflect and say, no, 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 no. If you want somebody to sing Ave Maria, you want Chaplain Marlene. She has the voice of an angel. And this all worked fine for quite some time. One day, I was at a service, and I could hear somebody near me singing. And out of the corner of my eye, I could see him swaying with joy and abandon. And he sounded really bad. <laughs> That's when I realized I was being ridiculous. It was time to get over this fear of singing. So the next day, I went into work, and I went straight to my friend Leslie, who has an amazing voice and has even recorded a couple of CDs. And I asked her to tell me how I could learn to sing. And I thought she was going to tell me I had to take a class or learn to read music or buy a metronome and sheet music. But she just said, well, Alyssa, just sing. And I was kind of confused. So I said, but well, what else do I have to do? And she said, just sing. Just pick a song that you know and sing it. Sing it until it is so comfortable, it's like putting on an old pair of jeans. So day after day, week after week, month after month, if I was alone, I was singing Amazing Grace. In my car on the way home from work, when I was doing the dishes or cleaning the bathroom at home, when I was in the shower or out for a run, I was singing. And sure enough, one day, I realized that I could sing. And I could check that off my list. I wasn't afraid to sing anymore. Well, a short time after that, I was called up to the psychiatric unit in the hospital where I work to see a patient who had been admitted with depression. And I knew from her chart how old she was, but when I looked in the window of the meeting room, she looked much older. She was folded over in her chair and I could barely see her face. And I entered the room and asked if she would like to chat a little bit. I asked her to tell me about herself, and she did. She told me about her pains and sorrows, her depression and hopelessness, and how sometimes she felt so disconnected from the God that she believed in. When she finished her story, there was silence between us. And I asked her if there had ever been a time that she could recall feeling hopeful or peaceful or connected to God. She looked up, and I thought I saw a little bit of a smile as she told me about singing with her church choir, practicing their favorite hymns week after week, and how much fun she had at choir practice, and how when she couldn't get herself to choir practice, her choir mates would call and text to check in on her, see how she was doing, see if she needed anything, and tell her that they missed her. And when she came back to choir practice, how they would warmly welcome her and embrace her. She told me about her favorite place in the choir loft where she could look out on this community that supported her and loved her, even when she wasn't with them. And in that moment, I knew there was only one thing to do. I asked her if she might like to sing a song together. And it's a fun fact that if you put two Catholics in a room <laughs> and you ask them what song they might like to sing together, there is really only one song. I knew that I couldn't hide behind the drapes and I couldn't pretend I had laryngitis, I couldn't call in a colleague or lip sync my way through this. So I took a deep breath and I closed my eyes and together we sang. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound.
the last part of the story was really about not just putting a, aside my fear of singing, because it was partly about that, but it was partly about just meeting this person, meeting this individual where she was and being in solidarity with her, just sitting with her, um, doing something that she had expressed was healing and meaningful to her. Um, and really, it wasn't so much about, you know, a patient and a chaplain, a caregiver and a care receiver, but really the end of that story is about two human beings spending time together and um, listening to one another and just being companions on the, on the journey. Watch Stories from the Stage anytime, anywhere. Visit worldchannel.org for full episodes and digital extras. Join us on social media and share your story only on World Channel.